Well, a very warm welcome to this week's online service from the Wirral Methodist Circuit. We do hope you can find somewhere quiet and peaceful for the next half an hour or so as we seek the face of God together. It's the second week in Advent, and of course Advent means coming or appearing, and it's the time when we look forward, obviously, to Christmas and the coming of Jesus as a baby, but there are two other comings of Christ that we read about in the Bible. The second one is when he comes into his ministry as a young man, and that's going to be part of our focus today. We're going to look at John the Baptist's role in preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. And finally, of course, we must remember that Jesus is going to come again, not as a baby, but as a conquering king. But before we go any further, let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, our prayer focus for the second week of Advent is the word peace, something which our world has very little of at the moment. But Lord, we know that when Jesus was prophesied to come, he was given the title, the Prince of Peace. And we know that where hearts receive him, he brings peace, peace with you, Father, a peace that passes all understanding. Father, we pray for the places where there is strife, whether it be in families or communities or countries. Lord Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, you said, blessed are the peacemakers. And so this morning we pray for all those who seek to bring peace, where there is war, who seek to bring love rather than hatred. Father, we ask a blessing for them and also for ourselves, that we might know your peace in our experience. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Our first hymn today is that great Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And do feel free to join in, won't you?
Well, we're going to share a short psalm together today, and it's Psalm 24. It's a psalm about approaching God ourselves, but it's also a psalm about the coming of the King. Mike's going to read this for us now, and do feel free to join in with the bold type if you'd like to make the psalm your own. We read together Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas, and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord, and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. We thought we'd try and get you in the mood for Christmas today. Quite a few of us from the Neston and District Churches together uh, work on a project called Open the Book and we have done a short first Christmas video for our local schools and we'd like to share that with you now and do feel free again to join in where you can. We have come to a very special time of the year. I wonder what you're looking forward to. For this special time of the year, we have a special story from the Bible. The Bible is divided into two parts. The first part tells what happened before Jesus was born, and the second part tells what happened after he was born. Today, we're going to open the book and read The First Christmas. The first Christmas. Good news! Hooray! Said the angel to a girl named Mary. God is sending someone special into the world. He will be a great king. His name will be Jesus. And guess what? God wants you to be his mother. Good news! Hooray! Said the angel to a carpenter named Joseph. God is sending someone special into the world. He will rescue everyone from the wrong things they have done. He will be God's own son. But guess what? God wants you to take his mother Mary as your wife and raise little Jesus as your own. Bad news. Oh. Sighed Joseph to Mary. The rulers of our country want to count us to see how many of our people there are. And to make it easier for them, we have to go back to our hometown. And that means a trip all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And with the baby due so soon. Oh, bad news. Oh. Sighed the innkeeper, shaking his head. There's not one room left in Bethlehem. But seeing as the young lady's expecting and all, why don't you spend the night in my stable? Good news! Hooray! Smiled Joseph, handing the baby to Mary. It's a boy, just as God promised. God's own son, there, in your arms, Jesus. Good news! Hooray! Call the angels to the shepherds on the hill. God has sent someone special into the world, the someone you have been waiting for. If you hurry into Bethlehem, you can see him for yourselves. He's just a baby now, wrapped up warmly and lying in a manger. But one day, he will save you from all that is wrong. One day, he will bring you peace. Then the angels filled the sky with a good news song. The 
shepherds went to Bethlehem and made a good news visit. And on that very first Christmas day, Mary just watched and rocked her baby and smiled a good news smile. There are so many things to enjoy at Christmas. Christmas trees, presents, special food and parties. Why do we do all these things? Well, it's to celebrate the birth of a special person. And that person is Jesus. Close your eyes and think of a time when you heard some good news. See if you can remember how happy you felt when you heard that good news. Think about that now. Now I'm going to say a prayer. And if you want to make it your prayer, say Amen at the end after me. Dear God, thank you that Jesus came to tell the good news of your love for us. We pray that everyone in this school will have a really happy Christmas. Amen. And a happy Christmas to you all. Bye-bye. Well, that's great fun and we'd like to now share with you a hymn with the children singing of Colours of Day. Again, feel free to join in. <laughs> Being the new lectionary year, we've moved our focus from the Gospel of Mark to the Gospel of Luke. We believe he was born in the ancient Syrian town of Antioch, that he was very well educated, a Greek speaker, 
and either a Gentile himself or a Jew who had been brought up in a predominantly Greek culture. And there is evidence that he was also medically trained, Luke the beloved physician. We believe that Luke not only wrote his great gospel, but also the book of Acts, that history of the early church. And we know as well that he was a companion of the Apostle Paul for at least part of his ministry. Luke writes very much like a historian. He has an eye for detail about important facts and the context in which he writes. And at the very start of his gospel, he introduces us to two important characters. Jesus, of course, yes, but also his relative John the Baptist. And we're going to look at the importance of John's role today. Luke is the only gospel writer who tells us anything about the birth of John the Baptist and the remarkable events which surrounded it. We're told that his father, Zechariah, was a priest and that he and his wife, Elizabeth, were getting on in years but had no children. While Zechariah was fulfilling his priestly office, offering incense on the altar in the house of the Lord, the angel Gabriel appears to him. Yes, the same Gabriel who appears to Mary. He is told that Elizabeth was going to have a child, something which Zechariah finds frankly unbelievable. And due to his lack of faith, he's struck dumb until the child is born. We're told that Mary is a relative of Elizabeth, and she goes to visit Elizabeth during her pregnancy probably to get away from all the gossip in Nazareth. Luke tells us that when the baby's born, they ask Zechariah what the baby's name was. And he writes down his name is John, at which point his voice returns to him. Zechariah then pours out praise to God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a great prophetic song which we know as the Benedictus. Gabriel has told Zechariah that John will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. In the Old Testament, there are three spirit-anointed ministries, that are prophet, priest, and king. And Gabriel has told Zechariah that John is going to go forth in the spirit and the power of Elijah, one of Israel's greatest prophets. So John has a prophetic mission. Luke writes, he will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and the power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In the Old Testament, the great prophets were sent to Israel, usually when things were not going well, where the nation had become apostate and turned away from the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the one who had brought them out of bondage out of the land of Egypt. Elijah's great ministry was to confront this false religion of the day, to call the people to repentance and to renew their allegiance to God. We can think of Elijah's great confrontation with the priests of Baal, where he says to the children of Israel, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And those of you who know the story will know that fire came down from heaven and consumed Elijah's offering, whereas the offering of the priests of Baal was left untouched. There's a definite pattern to the religious life of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. There are short periods where they honour God and are faithful to him. But this is usually swiftly followed with a decay into apostasy, where they flirt with the religions of the nations round about them. This results in discipline from God himself, where he allows them to become oppressed by those very surrounding nations. The people get to a desperate point where ultimately they turn back to the Lord their God and cry for deliverance. And God, in his mercy, responds only for the cycle to then repeat itself. In the end, God allows his people to be taken into exile in Babylon to return much later after a period of over 70 years. But they were never truly an independent nation again, a shadow of the former glories of Solomon and David, except for a short time under the Maccabees, an event which is celebrated by the Jewish community in the festival of Hanukkah. And you can read more about this in the apocryphal books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. In the time of the New Testament, the Jewish nation are again under the yoke of oppression. This time, it's the Romans, and the people are praying and waiting for deliverance from God. And they had been waiting for a very long time. They believed that one day the Messiah would come, and they expected that when he did, he would destroy all their enemies to set them free 
that he would restore the glories of Jerusalem and the temple, that he would collect his people from all four corners of the world, and that he would set up a kingdom of righteousness, peace, knowledge and truth, with Jerusalem as being the capital and the Jewish people preeminent above all the nations of the earth. Right throughout the Old Testament, the prophets tell their readers that oppression by other nations isn't the real problem, but it's just a symptom of a deeper problem. That the real problem was not the circumstances of God's people, but their hearts, which had strayed far from the Lord their God. And time and time again, God's people failed to learn this lesson. To compound matters even further, in the time of Jesus and John the Baptist, there had been a great silence for over 400 years since the last prophet, namely Malachi. There had been no prophetic utterance, no word of the Lord in the land at all. And God's people were beginning to wonder whether God had forgotten them completely. So the question on their lips is, does God still care for his people? And so we come to our reading for today, which takes us to the third chapter of Luke, and we're going to read verses 1 to 6, and Mike's going to lead us in the reading of that now. Our reading comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the regions of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the regions around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading starts off with Luke in historian mode, setting the context for what is going to come later. He tells us about the political realities of the day, first internationally with Caesar, and then focusing in onto the local rulers. Luke then sets the religious scene for us by telling us about the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. And so into this setting comes John the Baptist, prepared by God to be his prophet. His appearance certainly fits the bill, with his rough clothing and rather odd diet. A man of the wilderness, uncorrupted by the society. A holy man. A strange man. Luke uses the term, the word of God came to John. And we find this phrase in the Old Testament on numerous occasions where a message from God comes to a prophet to be passed on to his covenant people. Prophecy in the Old Testament is not necessarily about telling the future, although it often has that aspect. It's more about telling what God is saying to a people at a particular time. It's as much about the here and now as the times that are afar off. So John's message is as much about what the people have to do now as it is about the coming of Messiah. But what is quite clear is that the prophet is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and not just giving his own personal opinion. As the prophet Amos says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants the prophets. It's worth stopping for a moment and looking at the phrase, the word of the Lord. In scripture, there are a number of words for the, well, the word word. The one we're most familiar with, of course, comes in John's Gospel and is the concept of logos, the divine eternal word which is equated with God himself. That's not the word translated here, though. The Greek word translated here is the word rima, and that applies to not the eternal word, but the spoken word of God. It reminds us we have a God who speaks, who communicates to us. It's a dynamic word. When God speaks, things happen. We get a better understanding of the word rima if we delve back into the, the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah writes this, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Things are about to happen. 
and they're going to happen through the ministry of John the Baptist. Well, this, of course, brings us to the message that John has for God's people. And John's initial message would be very familiar to many of the Old Testament prophets. He's calling the people to repent, to radically change their lives, to turn their lives round through 180 degrees and seek God afresh. And the promise for those who do so is forgiveness from God for all their past apostasy. One of the unique hallmarks of John's ministry, though, is he links his message with the religious rite of baptism. It's a religious ritual that seeks to reinforce the personal response to God's message. It seeks to be an outward expression of an inward change of heart. We are very familiar with baptism in the life of the modern church, but for the people of John's day, it was a very rare event indeed, and certainly didn't have the significance of Christian baptism. The only time baptism was used was when a Gentile wished to convert to Judaism, and they would go through this ritual cleansing in order to be spiritually clean enough to become part of God's covenant people. It's often called proselytic baptism. For a Jew to be baptised was an act of great humility. It was evidence of a deep repentance, one that was so deep that the person viewed themselves as no better than a Gentile. And of course, this pointed forward to the reality where we all come to Jesus on the same terms, all the sinners in need of mercy, all sinners in need of a saviour. Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sees John's coming as being an evidence of a prophecy fulfilled. And he links it with the prophecy of Isaiah by quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. With the famous cry, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. We think that the prophecy of Isaiah was written in about 740 BC, and it's one of the great messianic prophecies, and would have been well known to the people of Luke's day. The prophecy of Isaiah is a long one, it's 66 chapters in all, and it naturally divides into two major sections, chapters 1 to 39, and then chapters 40 to 66. The great theme of the first 39 chapters is that of judgment. It's a catalogue of all Israel's failures and the consequences for them at God's hand. It's unremitting bad news. But when we get to chapter 40, everything changes. And from here on in, the theme is God's salvation rather than God's judgment. Chapter 40 starts off with the famous words, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. In the first 39 chapters, we hear God use the phrase, This people, followed by their sins. Here, though, it's changed to my people. And a few chapters later on, we're introduced to the suffering servant, which of course is the picture of the coming Christ, who will suffer for the sins of his people. And we have the picture of Messiah, not as judge, but as the great shepherd of the sheep, and so become their saviour. The great phrase, prepare the way of the Lord, begs a question, and that is, who is this Lord who is coming? Remember, a Lord, in biblical terms, is one who has authority over you, one to whom you bow your knee, and one to whom obedience is due. The Greek word here is Kyrios, which is in effect Supreme Lord. I suppose that narrows it down a bit. But to find out the true identity of this Lord, we need to go back to the original Hebrew in which the book of Isaiah was written. In the original, the word that is translated as Lord is the Hebrew Yahweh, which of course is the name of God himself, sometimes translated as Jehovah. So the conclusion we come to from this is that John is prophesying the coming of God himself. So God is coming. And of course, this turns out to be the man Jesus, the God-man, God the Son, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, if that answers the question, who is the Lord who is coming? Then the second question we need to ask is, well, what is he coming for? Isaiah uses poetic terms such as paths being made straight, valleys being filled, mountains being brought down, crooked ways being made straight, and rough ways smooth. In the ancient world, of course, if a king was coming to visit a town, great preparations would be made. Heralds would be sent before the coming of the king to give the people the time to get ready to prepare a proper royal welcome. 
But the inference here is not about physical realities, but about spiritual ones, about preparing yourself spiritually for the coming of Christ, about getting your life straightened out, getting rid of the problems and the crooked ways we tend to walk in. But we only come across the real purpose for the coming of God in the person of Christ at the very end of our reading today. And the end of the quotation from Isaiah reads, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So on this occasion, he's not coming to judge his people, but to save them. What's more, it's not just the Jews who are going to see the salvation of God. It's all flesh, implying all people, Jews and Gentiles. So this prophecy reveals to us that Jesus, who is coming, was God himself. And that he was not only God, but he was going to be the saviour of his people. Titus, in his letter in the New Testament, writes this, We wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is both God and Saviour. And so to our final hymn, which is going to be long ago, Prophets New, after which we'll conclude with prayer. God bless you. so to our final prayers for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not a God who stands afar off, but one who wants to come and dwell with his people. Lord, we thank you that you came in the person of your Son to save us from our sins. And Lord, we look forward today and we thank you that you will come again to put all that is wrong in this world right and to set up your eternal kingdom. And Father, we thank you that you invite us through faith to become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So we pray into the darkness of this world, into the shadows of the night, into this loveless place you came, lightened our burdens and eased our pain, and made these hearts your home. Into the darkness once again, O come, Lord Jesus, come. And may the coming King be gracious to you, 
and pour out his love upon you, and fill you with his Holy Spirit, and give you joy and peace. Amen. Amen. Uh-huh.